the body a cancer, uh, an environment that cancer hates. So we'll just define that again. It hates oxygen. Oxygen's the most vital element needed for life. And at our retreat, we have hyperbaric chambers. You've heard of hyperbaric chambers? Yeah. Hyperbaric chambers were first developed for divers with bends. He said, when we breathe in, we, um, we breathe in air. And air is about 79% nitrogen. It's about 21% uh, oxygen and a very small amount of carbon dioxide. And so what happened with the divers, they'd come up too quickly from the depths and the nitrogen would go into little, like little bubbles in the joints and the muscles and cause a lot of pain. So they discovered that if they put them into a pressurised uh, container with oxygen under pressure, it caused the, those little nitrogen bubbles to disperse. And Henry's law states that more gas will go into a liquid under pressure. So with the hyperbaric chamber, the gas is oxygen and the liquid, of course, is is the blood. But what they are finding is that people who are uh, suffering from cancer, the hyperbaric chamber is helping because the, the, the oxygen is put in under pressure. It's the most vital element needed for life. Now, not everyone's got to spare $30,000 to buy a hyperbaric chamber. And not everyone can pay, I, th I think uh, we charge $90 a treatment. So there's a bit of expense there. So I'm going to show you how you can uh, increase the oxygen going into your lungs. And that is by only nose breathing. So nose purifies the air and it purifies the air through these little channels in your nose and little hairs in your nose. Mouth does not do that. Nose also warms the air. Mouth does not do that. It moisturises the air and mouth does not do that. It pressurises the air because it comes in through little tiny channels instead of this big vacuum which is the mouth. And there are two main gases in our blood and that is carbon dioxide and oxygen. We have 75 trillion red blood cells and each red blood cell has 270 million haemoglobin. And the haemoglobin have four dockings, every one has four docking stations for oxygen. So when you're, when you're breathing in, and in your little alveoli, you've got this gaseous exchange. So if the blood has four molecules of carbon dioxide, it can pick up four molecules of oxygen. But if the blood only has two molecules of carbon dioxide, it can only pick up two molecules of oxygen. So yes, you can overdo the carbon dioxide in your blood, but you can also underdo the carbon dioxide in your blood. If you breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth, you lose too much carbon dioxide. So it needs to be in through the nose and out through the nose. And what that does is balances blood gases. And the blood gases are your oxygen and your carbon dioxide. And you've also got another exchange happening coming from the blood into the cell. And if someone's breathing in and out through their mouth, they can actually have too much carbon dioxide in their blood, but it cannot get into the cell because there's not enough carbon dioxide. So we need to breathe in and out through our nose and that will give us more oxygen. Carbon dioxide also opens the bronchioles. We'll see that tomorrow when we look at respiratory. I think it's tomorrow evening we're looking at respiratory. But it also acts as a vasodilator. What's a vasodilator? A vasodilator opens the blood vessels. That's what carbon dioxide does. When you breathe in through your nose, it stimulates a release of nitric oxide. 
Mouth does not stimulate a release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is antimicrobial, antibacterial, but nitric oxide also is a vasodilator, opens the blood vessels. So breathing in and out through your nose will guarantee more oxygen at the cellular level because it balances the blood gases. Blood gases being carbon dioxide, oxygen and nitric oxide. Mouth breathing will not do any of that. They've done experiments on monkeys where they blocked up their noses so they could only mouth breathe for several months. And what they found was, is their whole face structure changed? The, the, the mouth and the jaw dropped? And they were sick looking monkeys. And what they found is their blood pressure went up. Monkeys' blood pressure went up. What would happen in humans? And they also found that the backs of their nostrils started to shrink. What's the old saying? If you don't use it, you will lose it. So if you have a blocked nose, the best way to clear it is to breathe through the nose. <laughs> because when you breathe through the nose, and that's what they did, unpluck the poor old monkeys' noses and then take up their mouths, force them to breathe through their nose, the whole face structure changed. The jaw came back in in its proper shape. But what they found was that the little tubes at the back of the nose that had started to shrink up started to open. So a lot of people breathe through their mouth because they say, well, I can't get enough air through the nose. Do you know you could if you started to breathe through the nose? And the hardest time to breathe through your nose is when you're exercising. Try it. <laughs> you're going to feel like you're dying. And you're going to feel like you're not getting enough oxygen. But you actually get more oxygen if you breathe through your nose. Because remember, you might take in more oxygen, but it can't get here. And that's what it's all about. So you don't actually have to go and find somewhere with a hyperbaric chamber. All you have to do is train your body back into nose breathing. Rome wasn't built in a day. If you can't breathe through your nose in and out when you exercise tomorrow, be patient with yourself. I didn't think I could do it, but I can do it now. Even when I get to the top of my high intensity exercise, you just force yourself to breathe in and out through your nose and you're actually getting more oxygen. And you get more oxygen, what have you got more of? You've got more energy. And remember, cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. And so the sustain me, to show you how you can use the sustain me to bring about the conditions in the body that the body needs to heal, the two specifics to increase oxygen are inhaling through the nose. Inhaling and exhaling through the nose. And you'll get better at it and you can tape your mouth up to encourage your body to do that. But you will guarantee more, more oxygen. The cells when we're dehydrated, tend to clump together like this. And when the cell goes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen like a little parcel. Like this. In dehydration, where the cells tend to clump, how much oxygen's been picked up? Can you see that you can diminish the amount of oxygen available at the cellular level if you're dehydrated. And you can drink two litres of water in the morning and you can be dehydrated by five o'clock in the afternoon. Have you noticed how God sends the water on the earth? In gentle rain, little by little. That's how we should take the water in. But sometimes we have a storm and the water pelts down too hard. What happens? You lose your topsoil. The rivers come up, houses are lost. 
That's what happens when you drink too much water too fast. You drink, you drink 16 ounces all at once, it's not long before 16 ounces is going to have to come out. And this is great news for elderly people who don't want to drink water because they don't want to have accidents. So I show them how to drink little by little by little. I wake up in the morning, I have half a glass of water. I go to the bathroom, I have half a glass of water. I pray, I have half a glass of water. I read my Bible, I have half a glass of water. And you see what I do? You spread it out. I always have the water next to me. I never used to drink water because I found it hard to drink a whole glass at once. When you've just climbed to the top of a mountain, it's easy. But the hardest part's in the winter. And that's where you need it. So little by little by little you take the water in. Now when the water comes out, it doesn't come out as pure water. Of course it doesn't come out. It's bringing out our waste, but it's also salty. Our perspiration's salty. So the more, more, the more water you drink, the more salt you use. So use, use of water implies that there's a time to drink water and there's a time not to. But we also need the whole salt because the whole salt helps our body access the water. So when is there a time not to drink water? That's with our meals. Because when we drink with our meals, we dilute our gastric juices, which are required to digest the meal. We should stop drinking about half an hour before the meal and resume drinking about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. If you're thirsty after a meal, it's a clear indication that you sat to eat your meal dehydrated. Now, if you're thirsty after a meal, by all means have a mouthful. A mouthful's not going to make a huge difference but it's more taking a large amount of water with the meal. And how many people were in such a fast society today, run, 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 rush, 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 sit to eat, oh no, I haven't drunk water. And the, the water is drunk with the meal. Then the, high, the gastric juices are watered down and then digestion is slowed down because the stomach can't digest the meal until the, until the gastric juices come up to a very acid condition. If someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, fantastic, it's supposed to be. <laughs> Did you know that dogs have ten times the hydrochloric acid that we do? Yeah. And you notice they don't get uh, reflux or heartburn or stomach ulcers? But if you notice what they eat, eesh, they eat things that would kill us. My daughter's dog pulled the bone of a dead cow into the yard. We, oh, what's that smell? And the dog's eating it. That's because hydrochloric acid is a very strong antimicrobial. Kills. Kills yeast, fungus, bacteria. So hydrochloric acid is actually necessary. It's a very important part of our digestion. There's only one part of the body that should be acid and that's the stomach. When you wake up in the morning it's not acid only becomes acid when the hydrochloric acid is released because you smell, think, start to eat food and it's released. And we've got a thick mucosa wall lining the stomach to protect the stomach so that the acid doesn't eat the stomach. If we, if we comply with these basic laws that are guaranteed to sustain us, then the body runs well, digestion runs well. But remember, our body is a creature of habit. And if someone's been on antacids for 20 years, geez, they're going to have to retrain their body back. <laughs> Do you know what's happening with long-term antacid use? Colon cancer. Because what's happening is the food's not getting broken down properly, so partially digested food is getting into the colon that should not be there because it should all already have been absorbed, but it can't be absorbed because it's not broken down to the state it should be. And so bacteria and different microbes have to be, to pro be produced to try and calm down this partially digested food and then contributing to colon cancer. No, the, the, the acid's not the stomach. It's not the problem because it should be acid. So I say to someone, how do you know it's acid? Well, it keeps coming up. Well, the problem's not the acid. The problem's the little gate here. So it's called the cardiac sphincter, that little gateway that goes into the stomach. 
And if the acid's coming up, the problem's not the acid, the problem's the gait. So why is the gait weak? Because the person's eating breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and supper is the king and the queen together. How many people do that? And then when they lie down to go to sleep, gravity causes that food to push against the cardiac sphincter, weakening it. Now, it's, the odd, it's not the odd day you might have an evening meal, or the odd day you don't, it's what you do every day. It's week after week after month after month of having that large meal at night, little by little is weakening that, that cardiac sphincter. Stress, the cardiac sphincter is a muscle. And when we're tense, it opens. And I love the way the writer said that when we sit to dine, we should cast off care and anxious thought when we sit to dine. So when we're stressed out, when we're running to eat, when there's, we're trying to deal with a stressful situation and eat our lunch, uh, it's not working properly because the hydrochloric acid isn't released unless we're relaxed and the cardiac sphincter is open. So everyone that comes to us with reflux or heartburn goes home without it because we serve breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea or supper like a pauper. One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> and we give them magnesium. Magnesium is the ultimate stomach uh, muscle relaxant. So, it re And when that little muscle is relaxed, it's closed. And the other problem is that many people are eating all day long. But because of uh, the 5-2 the diet, the intermittent fasting, there's a new message, and that message now with eating is time-restricted eating. And time-restricted eating suggests we eat twice in 24 hours, six hours apart. That's, that's the old saying, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen. And not an evening meal. If we're not getting the nutrients out of our food, it's very difficult for us to heal. But when we eat breakfast like a king and lunch like a queen and don't eat again or if anything's eaten at night, it should be very light. So many tradesmen, they're having breakfast at six, they're having lunch at 12, they're going to need something at night. They're working physically hard. But it still should be the lighter meal of the day. And if breakfast and lunch is substantial, not much is needed at night. So let me explain <coughs> nutrition. And I mentioned three food groups in the last lecture. These food groups are the three essential food groups. So the three essential food groups are fibre. Why fibre? Because our gastrointestinal tract needs to be swept every day. And fibre not only sweeps the gastrointestinal tract, but fibre also stimulates peristalsis. What's the house smell like if you don't empty your, you call it a trash bin? If you don't empty it for a couple of weeks, it smells pretty bad, doesn't it? <coughs> Our gastrointestinal tract is designed to empty after every meal. When we eat, and the stomach starts massaging and helping to uh, break the food down, it stimulates the whole of the gastrointestinal tract. So the most natural time to eliminate is after the meal. Dr Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. And one of the reasons that colon cancer happens is because the evacuation is not happening regularly enough. And if you notice that our colon's got a mind of its own, if you say it to go, it won't. And if you say it to stop, it won't. Mm -hmm. It needs gentle stimulation. And it also needs us to listen. It's very important that we learn to take attention of our body, listen. And many people don't do this. They don't promptly answer nature's immediate call. Isn't that true? When the body says go, you've got to go. 
And if you don't go when the body says go and then you try and go later, you notice you can't. Because when we feel to go, the contents is right, pressing really almost on the anus. And if we don't go, and praise God that we have the ability to hold because the plane's about to land and you can't go. <laughs> but I think you'll agree with me, that's not often. <coughs> So what the body does is it takes it back into the, into the former part of the colon. And one of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. So the longer it's there, the more water take, gets taken out and then we've got rabbit pellets and cement forming. <laughs> so it's important to go when the body says go. It's an important part of listening to the body. One lady, she's a... Um, She's a lady that uh, guides and directs many business people. She said, if I'm on the phone I say, and I need to go, I say, excuse me, Mrs. excuse me, a crisis has arisen, I'll ring you back. She goes to the bathroom. <laughs> it, it is important. And remember, it's not the odd day you might not go or the odd day you do. It's what you do every day that matters. And fibre gently stimulates the colon and fibre also sweeps the colon. So one of the main causes of colorectal cancer is a refined diet with no fibre and a high meat diet which has no fibre. Sometimes when people are reading that grizzly steak they think that's a lot of fibre. It's not fibre. It's not fibre at all. And the only way Dr Robert Atkins got away with his high meat, high fat diet was his patients had to eat three cups of vegetables a day. The vegetables moved things through because he knew that it had to, had to move. The highest fibre food is really your vegetables, certainly your fruit as well. But remember, your vegetables are high in fibre, high in minerals, low in sugars, whereas your fruit, it's high in fibre, but it's high in sugars and low in minerals. So it's your vegetables that are your healers. But there's a group of fruits that are called the savoury fruits. That's avocado, tomato, cucumber, uh, eggplant, zucchini, squash, pumpkin. In fact, what you call squash, we call pumpkins. So I think you'll agree with me, they're the savoury fruits. See, the classification of the fruit is it has its seed in it and they all have seeds in it. So when I say the no fruit diet, because what are we wanting to... We're wanting to, we're, we're wanting to get the glucose down. And so we advocate the no fruit diet for six weeks. So what does the person eat? Well, we've got our second essential nutrient, which is protein. Yesterday, we, or this morning, I should say, we looked at the crossbud bands in the DNA. They're made up of amino acids. We looked at the new cell. It's made with amino acids. Amino acids is a breakdown from the protein that we eat. You can't, you can't maintain the proper functioning of the body without protein. You cannot heal without protein. And your best proteins are your plant proteins. So your plant proteins are your legumes. In his book, uh, The Plant Paradox, Dr Stephen Gundry, he says, don't eat legumes, they're high in lectins. And lectins are inflammatory uh, molecules. But have you read the fine print? If it's well rinsed and well soaked and pressure cooked, there's no leg, leg, lectins. Uh, Sally Fallon in her book Nourishing Traditions, she looks at the traditional way people used to make food. And if you make food in the traditional way, long, slow cooking, what did they used to do with the legumes? They'd, rinse, they'd soak them overnight, then they'd rinse them well, then they'd put the corner on the fuel stove and they'd just pop away in the corner. Well, we can, we can replicate that with the slow cookers. I had lunch at Chipotle's today. I love beans and greens. I didn't have the rice, I just had that bean and that bean and that tofu. I, the 
protein. The protein is very important. And I saw they had a huge slow cooker. <laughs> and rinse them. That's dirty water. Rinse them. Rinse them. Rinse them. You can't really rinse them when they're fully cooked or you'll lose half your bean. So you rinse them when they're half or three quarters cooked. And you will have no problem. Because of the way we prepare our legumes, none of our guests have a problem with it. The other protein is found in your nuts. Nuts are so delicious it's easy to overdo them. How many people don't eat nuts for two weeks and buy a packet of cashews and eat the whole lot in the afternoon? <laughs> so what it's best to do is have about eight to ten every meal. That's what I do. You just get the, the nuts you're going to eat, put the lid on the jar, put it in the cupboard, shut the door, put the padlock on it. <laughs> they are delicious. <laughs> In fact, I think it makes a delicious dessert. It's just a handful of nuts after the meal. And your seeds, and we have so many seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower, flax or, or linseed, chia, and fats. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. Fat is an essential nutrient. You cannot heal without fats. You cannot function without fats. But the brain cell is a bit different. It's 70% fat. It's the fattiest organ in the body. And a big contributing factor to dementia and depression today is this ridiculous fat-free diet. When we look at heart disease later on in the week, I'll show you that there is no proof that fat causes heart disease. That's shocking, isn't it? Where's my little lies list? I've, uh, I've rubbed it out. Do you remember lies? Where we've been deceived. So let's look at the um, BHSC method, Bible history, science, common sense, to determine should we eat fats. What does the Bible say about olive oil? Yes. <laughs> Do you remember the story of Elijah, time of no rain? God said, a widow will feed you. And Elijah said... If you bake me a cake every day, day, God said the oil will not lack and the, and the, nor the meal <coughs> fail. And every morning there was a bit more flour and a bit more oil in her cruise. Who put the oil in that cruise? What has God just said? I'm, we need the oil. I'm sure he didn't give her a quarter day. It's concentrated. We don't need much, but we do need a little. So the Bible says yes to fats. History shows us that the fats have been eaten for centuries. Science shows us that every membrane is 50% fat. Science also shows us the brain's the fattiest organ in the body. We need the fats. What are the best fats? The nuts, the seeds... Olive and coconut oil. They're the two f oils that have been used for centuries and they're the two oils that are extracted from the flesh of the plant. In fact, traditionally, women could even extract those oils in their kitchens. They're the three essential food groups. The non-essential food group. The non-essential food group is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not bad. It's only when they're overdone and refined. And when someone's wanting to lower the glucose, because remember, the cancer cell consumes 15 times the glucose of any other cell, it's important to get the carbohydrate content down. So what does the person eat? Breakfast. What's a breakfast on someone with a no-fruit diet? A breakfast might be uh, avocado. We suggest 50% raw, 50% cooked. Cooked will deliver what raw won't and raw will deliver what cooked won't. That's what I aim for, 50-50. Avocado, tomato. 
My daughter grows microgreens. Magnificent. So maybe some greens, might be microgreens, might be lettuce, might be cabbage. And then <clears throat> maybe a cup of lentils. Maybe they've been cooked in the crock pot overnight. Maybe you prefer black-eyed beans. Maybe you prefer cannelloni beans. What one lady told me she did, Monday, Monday was lentil day. Tuesday was, you call it peas, don't you? Black-eyed pea day. Uh, Wednesday was kidney bean day. Can you see what's happening here? And there are so many legumes, you could just about have a different legume every day for two weeks. Tofu might be one day, as long as it's organic, as long as it hasn't been genetically modified. A friend of mine did a thesis on soy. She has one answer when people ask her about the soy. She said, it's really simple. God made it good, man mucked it up. So when you eat soy, just make sure it's organic because an organic farmer won't use genetically modified seed. And Monsanto is so big, he wins every court case where people are pushing to get it set, you know, labelled on, or set on the label. But if you eat organic, you can be just about um, assured that it's not genetically modified. So a cup of lentils, maybe eight nuts, maybe some chia. Might have some steamed veggies with that. What about lunch? Well, the person might make the lentils into a uh, shepherd's pie. Salad, nice big salad, everything you love, whatever works for you. Uh, cooked vegetables, so those vegetables might be baked, might be uh, steamed, might be stir-fried, and then protein. And the protein might be, again, if it's your lentil day, you might do a lentil dal. You might, be, you might do a shepherd's pie. You might make it into some patties. There's many different ways you can do it. Say you have a chickpea day, you might have chickpeas for breakfast just in with some salt and herbs and a bit of oil. And then for lunch, you might blend it up and make hummus. For lunch, you might mash it up and make... Um, falafels out of it. So there's so many things you can do. So many things. And the protein will be the legume and some nuts and seeds. There are so many different legumes, there are so many different vegetables that you can have quite a variety. I put my husband on this diet when he was... 30, he had his wisdom teeth taken out with some students under general anaesthetic and they wired his jaw and broke it. And then his face swelled up like this and basically antibiotics saved his life. So when I married him, about um, 10 years later, he had major fungal problems. <laughs> I'd wake in the night with him scratching. So we reduced the sugars in his diet. We uh, had him on some herbs. But a bit of stress came along and it got worse. So I said, I'm putting you on the, uh, on the no fruit diet for six weeks. Well, he said he thought his, his throat was cut for the first few days. <laughs> I used to make a little stir fry veggie for him every morning. And there, you have a magnificent bread here in, in the US. You can, it's an online shop and it's Simple Needs. K N E A D S dot com. And they will ship anywhere, but apparently I was talking to the guy that owns it, Tristan, and he said that he's in negotiations with, with Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Sprouts, and his bread is going 
everywhere. It's a sourdough, it's organic, and it is uh, all gluten free. So it has it's high protein, low carbohydrate. And it's beautiful bread. I have never tasted such delicious gluten free bread because I think you'll agree with me not all gluten free bread is very nice. This is soft and delicious. And his competitors say to him, we don't know how you do it. <laughs> he lists on his bread what he puts in it, but no one can replicate his bread. Beautiful bread. So that is the best bread because, again, it's low carbohydrate. So what I did for Michael, he'd have his stir-fried vegetables, he'd have his sourdough toast with avocado and some one day lentils on top, another day black-eyed beans on top, another day scrambled tofu on top, one day red lentil, one day uh, green lentils. We t totally conquered his problem. And after six weeks he said, do I have to go back on fruit? So it's now ten years later and I still make stir-fry vegetables for him every single morning. Because his body said yes. Now he will manage this for the rest of his life. But if he eats well, he has no problem. I, have, I am never woken with scratching in the night anymore. But if he goes out and has a Chinese meal or has a, a huge fruit meal, maybe three bunches of grapes, I see him starting to scratch his toes. <laughs> so he manages it. Everyone I know is managing something. And if you can manage it, you're doing very well. And the Bible says that one day Jesus will come again. Then we'll all be cured. Yes. But until then, we manage. And if you can manage, you're doing well. So Michael, I hear him telling people he has never had such good health. What is he, 65 now? And he has no health problems at all. <laughs> He's conquered them by the way he eats. And he's by home by himself now and I get photographs. He's very proud of what he cooked for his breakfast because when I met him he could cook toast, that's about it. <laughs> he cooks himself a cob of corn, steams some vegetables and has avocado and tomato and he has his sourdough toast. He's very proud of his breakfast. And this contains all of these, but it's low on the carbohydrates. He doesn't have cancer, but he just does very well on that diet because it keeps that fungal component that he battled for over 10 years. And he just thought he was going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. How many people think that? And yet, and yet we conquered it. We conquered it from the inside out. So what do you do after six weeks? Well, some people like Michael will say, do I have to eat fruit? And I say, no. <laughs> and some people say, oh, I just can't wait to put my teeth into an apple. <laughs> and so after six weeks, the person can go on a low, very low, sweet fruit, like grapefruit, Granny Smith apples. And then they might stay on that for two months and then after two months they go on a little bit more fruit which would be uh, your uh, cherries, all your berries are very low, low sugar too. And this is what Elizabeth Cott did and she called that her maintenance diet. Now I'm pretty sure that Elizabeth Cott today, it's very similar to me. I actually eat a high fibre generous protein, great fats, low carbohydrate diet. Why do I do that? I just love what it does. I have lots of energy, I sleep very well. Weight just stays the same. What does the Bible say? Prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. If it works, do it. If it's not working, keep adjusting till it does. But also there might be another factor and that's time. Give it a little bit of time. In fact, one writer in Australia, he said, when you deprive cancer cells of glucose, it's like you have a sledgehammer effect 
on cancer cells. You see, to be able to function, to be able to survive, they need that high, gl high glucose coming in so that it can run here. But when you supply the foods that slowly release the glucose, oh, this, this pathway can certainly wait for that. And when you're at the same time putting heaps of glucose, heaps of oxygen, I should say, in, that functions very nicely. So you can switch the cancer cells from, from being the cancer cells down, back down to a normal cell by guaranteeing lots of oxygen and having a low glucose diet. And the third one is alkalis. The most alkaline. The most alkaline foods are your vegetables because vegetables are very high in minerals and it's your minerals that you alkalizes. So there's a few specifics that you can do to help guarantee an alkaline environment in the body. So what we do when people come to us wanting to conquer cancer, we give them green drinks. How do we make the green drinks? Well, we live out in the bush and we've got gardens, so we gather wild greens. We gather all the edible greens and we blend it with water. We usually put a lot of mint in so it tastes nice. So we blend it with water and then we strain it. So it's about four cups of greens to four cups of water. And we put them in little bottles and they'll drink that about three to four cups of that through the day. So the alkalining minerals are magnesium, calcium, potassium, sodium and iron. And your dark green leafy vegetables are very high in these alkaline minerals. So if someone doesn't have greens available to make a green drink, they can buy green barley powder, or barley green powder, or you can buy super green powders. So you can buy these powders and my suggestion is a teaspoon of that in a little bit of maybe lemon and water, then it makes it easy to drink. Maybe three, three to four cups of that a day. So these high alkaline minerals are alkalizing from the inside. What about sodium bicarbonate? Sodium bicarbonate is the ultimate alkalizer. But if you take sodium bicarbonate by mouth, all it will do is neutralise your stomach acid. So sodium bicarbonate will alkalise what it touches. And Dr Tullio Simoncini, he's an Italian oncologist that wrote a book and the title of his book is Cancer is a Fungus. And it was probably about 10 years ago that he... Um, he put up on YouTube and he showed someone with lung cancer and he had a little uh, camera in there and showed the cancer. And what he would do is he'd have a portacath in and he would inject sodium bicarbonate. And, and he had this little film clip where you could see the, <laughs> the cancer basically shriveled up. You see, cancer loves an acid environment and what sodium bicarbonate does, it gives a wave of alkalinity so it just can't survive. He was getting a 90 success, 90 percent success rate. So did he get a Nobel Prize? Uh, no, he's in jail on a charge of manslaughter. They've taken all his qualifications away from him. Apparently he injected someone with sodium bicarbonate and they died, but you don't know the story whether they were about to die anyway. Over the 15 years that we've been running our retreat up in the Misty Mountain Hills, We've had two people die, but you know they were given f they were given five days to live, and they came to us. <laughs> and it's just anyway. The good news is we we weren't attacked at all because the doctor had already proclaimed that they would live 
five days and, you know, they lived another maybe six or seven days. And we're good friends with the local doctor and he, he really supports what we do because he sees lives change. So I wonder if that was the case with Dr Tullio Simoncini's patient. You know what my husband said? If only he'd injected him with chemotherapy. <laughs> he wouldn't be on a, ma a charge of manslaughter. Am I right? Yeah. How many die from chemotherapy? But there's no, no accountability for that at all. Did you know that chemotherapy is cytotoxic? Cytotoxic means it's poison to the cell. And how chemotherapy works is like this. The chemotherapy comes in, the cancer cells consume 15 times the chemotherapy of a normal cell and so usually more cancer cells die than healthy cells. But some healthy cells will die. You see, later in the week we'll be looking at how to boost our immune system. And our immune system is basically you know, our, our, our front line of defence, chemotherapy just slaughters the immune system. It makes no sense to war against the very principles or the very processes that, the, that God put into the body to bring about a healing condition. Some people have chemotherapy and survive, but it's usually when it's an external cancer and it's usually because they've got a shock with the diagnosis of cancer and they change their diet. One lady told me she had this tumour that was blocking her intestines. She had chemotherapy and radiotherapy. It shrunk the tumour and now she was able to go and then she came to us and did a total lifestyle change. One lady told me that she had breast cancer diagnosed with breast cancer. So she just told the doctor, take both breasts off. And they did. And then she showed me how she had a scar on her abdomen like this. They opened her up, scooped out the fat and built two new breasts. In fact, she lifted her top and said, look. And I said, hmm, they did a good job. <laughs> But it's now, it's now 10 years later and she has breast cancer in her new breasts. If you don't turn the tap off, if you don't find the cause, you will not have a cure. An important part with all endocrine cancers, whether it be breast, whether it be uterine, whether it be cervical, whether it be prostate, an, an integral or first step part of that is balancing your hormones. The Cancer Foundation have stated that oestrogen is a known human carcinogen and the pill is the very, is the very thing that gets the oestrogen levels up high. That's how it stops a woman falling pregnant which we'll look at in more detail when we look at hormones. So that's another important part. What we also find is that sometimes the cause of cancer can be a bad tooth. So we had a lady attend our program, she was only 40 and she had had bone cancer in her jaw and her jaw was all misshapen because they'd taken part of the jaw out. And then as I'm investigating, I said, do you have any root canals? He said, she said, I did. I had one right there and she pointed right to where uh, she'd had the bone cancer. And I said, uh, what happened? She said, well, I had a root canal, but it hurt and it hurt and it hurt and I just kept taking painkillers, painkillers, painkillers. She did not do this. Listen. And eventually the pain was so great that the painkillers weren't dulling it anymore. And she went to the dentist and the root canal had gone rotten because a root canal filling is a dead tooth. And what does the body try and do to dead things? Eject. And because there's no nerve in that tooth anymore, you can't feel if there's an abscess building up underneath and often it does. So what had happened, because she didn't listen or didn't do anything about it, it infected the next tooth. And what happens with the teeth, here's the, here's the jawbone, 
The, the root of the tooth is connected to the jawbone by the periodontal ligament. So what happens is, trying to eliminate that tooth, infection can fed up, set up here. Can you see that through this, through this jaw you've got your blood, you've got your lymph, it can poison the whole body. And so the doctor or the dentist had to take out both teeth. Six months later, she was diagnosed with bone cancer in that jaw. I said it was the root canal. She said, do you think that's connected? Well, it's not rocket science, is it? And one of the problems with medicine today is that the doctor will never ask you about your teeth. Because he says that's the dentist's problem. <laughs> but the source of a cancer can be a root canal filling. You see, this, every tooth has a connection to a different part of the body. And we had one lady who had a cancer of the eye, was eating right out here, and she had a root canal in her eye tooth. Sometimes that can be the connection. So can you see that you can't just say, this causes cancer? Because there are so many different factors. Probably the only part time I could say this causes cancer is that smoking causes lung cancer. That's pretty clear. <laughs> In fact, 99% of people who tell me that their parent, you know, their father or their mother died of lung cancer, what's my next question? Did they smoke? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. And I say 99.9% .9 of the time because there are some people who get lung cancer who've never smoked, like my auntie but her husband of 25 years smoked. So it was that passive smoke that was coming in. She died in her 60s, he died in his 80s, and he was the smoker. Sometimes you see that. And that's why it's so important to look at the history and find out all the factors that have come together to cause this. But no matter what the cause, no matter what the cause, we find that the same treatment will help all. There may be some specifics, like with your endocrine cancers, the hormones need to be balanced. So how do you use the sodium bicarbonate? The only time we advise taking it by mouth is if someone has throat cancer, they can gargle it. What would be the proportions? You would use one teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate to one cup of water. You could gargle with that. Mouth cancer, you could gargle with it. Stomach cancer, you could take it first thing in the morning when there's no digestion happening, maybe an hour before you're going to have your meal. And the person could take it just before they go to bed at night. Because remember, the acid to break down your food is only released when you think, smell, taste food. <laughs> then it's released. So you don't want to stop your digestion. Sodium bicarbonate could also be used in an enema if someone has colon cancer. Remember, it'll alkalize and make it very difficult for cancer to survive if it touches it. One teaspoon to one cup. Pardon? Yep, yep. So for an enema, the person might just do warm water to empty the colon and then, and then take the sodium bicarbonate in and hold it for about 10 minutes and then let it out. But what we do at Misty Mountain is we do sodium bicarbonate wraps. And with the sodium bicarbonate wraps, we do two kilo of sodium bicarbonate to five litres of hot water. And with that, we usually do the juice of a lemon. And this is what we did with um, Elizabeth Cott the lady who conquered her tumours in her abdomen. This two kilo, uh, how will you take the person? 
I'm about to tell you. This is wraps. So this is wrapping the outside of the body. Now this is quite a concentrated treatment and a person really has to be a little trained in this. So what we do is we dip a towel in, we wring it out and we wrap it around the torso and then it's quickly covered because you can't let any air get to the wet towel. We do boiling water because by the time you've wrung it, you've got to have rubber gloves, and by the time you pull it out and wrap it around, it's losing its heat and it must be hot. Then we do one leg and then we cover the leg with a, um, do you call them trash bag? Call them garbage bag. Plastic's not touching the skin, it's just covering and keeping it hot. Then a blanket around that, then the other egg, blanket around that. Then cover that with a blanket. Only wool. You can only use a woolen blanket. Those fluffy mink blankets, there's none of those in my house. That's, that's plastic fabric. <laughs> I don't like it. Must be wool. Only wool will insulate. Then you do one arm, then the other arm. I didn't realise this for about a year but it is up on YouTube. When I was in Invercargill a few years ago now, an Indian doctor wanted me to do it and he filmed me and they put that up on YouTube and the Healthcare Complaints Commission, that's one of the reasons they attacked me. In fact, when I was in the tribunal, they said, why did you put that up on YouTube? I said, I didn't, I didn't even know it was there. <laughs> So you can watch it and you can see how it's done. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's a good idea to practice on each other before you actually do it because you cannot let any air get to those wet towels because then the, the person will chill. And we wrap the whole person up in a few blankets and then they are staying there for one hour. And what happens is with those hot, Moist, wet towels, the pores open and the skin takes in the sodium bicarbonate and it takes it where it needs to go. So you're using the skin. So with Elizabeth Cott, we didn't have the hyperbaric chamber when she came to us eight years ago. We did five wraps a week and she was with us for two weeks. And then the only time she had the wraps was with us. We gave her the green drinks and she did castoral compresses on her abdomen. Castoral penetrates deeper than any other oil and it can break up unnatural formations. I gave a story the mo this morning about, oh sorry, it was the last lecture, about the lady who used the castoral compresses on, on her breast. So depending on where the cancer is, there might be some little extras here and there, like with the breast. If it's uterine cancer, the castoral compresses can be done on the abdominal area. If it's, uh, if it's in the vagina, they can make um, suppositories, half castor oil and half coconut oil. And you know, you've got the fingers of a disposable glove, you pour it into the fingers <laughs> and when it solidifies you cut them off and there's your suppository. That can be put into the colon, that can be also put in the vagina. So depending on where the cancer is there might be uh, there might be some water treatments that you would do, there might be some poultices that you would do. We'll be covering water treatments and poultices I think Thursday we'll do the natural treatments. So there are some specifics for different areas. But whatever the cancer is, we find it all responds to this. So we had a man attend our program who had prostate cancer. With prostate cancer, the balancing of the hormones is very important and there's a herb called sol pimento. And Saul Pimento is excellent at reducing the inflammation of the prostate. He was a strawberry farmer. So we saw that one of his main problems was exposure to chemicals on, on the strawberry plants. We also, and it's not easy to discuss this one, but 
for a period of time this man had a problem with pornography. And when a man ejaculates sexually, he exhausts all his zinc. And zinc is necessary to, in a roundabout process to help reduce the inflammation of the prostate gland. He had conquered that problem in his life, but for many years he was continually exhausting his zinc. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that a, a, a man and a wife can't have sex, but, but when it's being exhausted every day, every day, every day, every day. Now, I'm not talking about a young couple that's just got married. Of course, they're going to <laughs> enjoy daily sex for a while. But you can see what I'm saying. When it's overdone over many, many years, it exhausts the zinc, and the zinc plays a protective role in protecting a man from prostate cancer. So you can see there are a few factors. When they came to our retreat, he really did not want to be there, but he didn't want to have chemo, he didn't want to have radiotherapy, he didn't like what the doctor was offering. So he came a little reluctantly, just knowing he had to do something. But his wife and his daughter came. He was in his 50s, his daughter was in her early 30s, and his wife and his daughter were really keen and he was, oh, whatever, whatever. We said, raps. Oh, I don't know. And his wife and daughter said, he'll do it, he'll do it. <laughs> and every time we gave him a green drink, he was, oh. And they were, yes, he'll drink it, he'll drink it. So he had this cheer squad with him the whole time. <laughs> he enjoyed the week. We have our steam baths also. That's a great way. And I know some health retreats like Eden Valley, I know they do the hyperbaric chamber and also the fever baths. So there are a few, a few bits and pieces that different people do and they certainly all help. But I found that these were the three con common denominators. And so at the end of, he just did one week with us. At the end of the week, we showed him a program he could do. So no fruit for six weeks and then the low, low, uh, low sweet and then as I explained before. Three months later, we get an email from him. He said, I'm cancer-free. Now he's interested. <laughs> he's very keen now. But I thought it was an interesting story because he was sort of half-hearted about it, but his wife and his daughter were, you know, he was, you know the good thing was he cooperated. <laughs> but he's, he's very interested now. So we have seen quite a few people recover from cancer. Much depends on the type of cancer. Much depends on how advanced it is. Much depends on how diligent the person is to do what you've got to do. Elizabeth Cott was very diligent and she certainly got the results. So when people come to us with cancer, we say to them, we've seen three outcomes. We've seen turnarounds from cancer. We have seen Six years um, happen when they were told they'd have six months. We've seen the last days made more comfortable. So whatever the stage of cancer, can you see the natural treatments are always a plus. Because the fact is, more people die from chemotherapy than from cancer. And it's very difficult when you're in the system very, very difficult to say no. That's why you're better to say, what is it, don't, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> I'll seriously consider what, what you've told me. And one lady came to us, brain cancer. Head was on the side, she was shaking. She was in a wheelchair, she was only in her 50s. And her daughter said to us, you know, she was just on the mobile phone the whole time. Years just on the mobile phone. And they think that was a contributing factor. We discovered that she hadn't opened her bowels for six days. So we got things moving there. And we started to implement the basic program. She went home feeling so much better. In fact, the doctor couldn't believe the difference that he saw in her. Six months later, she got the, she got the all clear, no, no more brain tumour. She was rubbing castor oil into it as well. 
but she still had the shake. She still had her head on the side. And the doctor said it was the damage from the radiotherapy. So when she first found out she had a brain tumour, they said, quick, we can get you in to do radiotherapy straight away. It's going to shrink the tumour. That sounds attractive. But it's very difficult. I know it's even better today to target it, but it's still very difficult not to damage any other cell. So they had targeted the tumour with radiotherapy, but it actually had damaged her brain stem. And the doctor admitted if she hadn't had the radiotherapy, she possibly could have fully recovered. But because of the damage done from the radiotherapy, she basically had to stay in the wheelchair for the rest of her life. Now, she had a much better quality of life because of what she did, and she certainly did live another 10 years. So you can see by what I've told her today, there's no wonder cure. This is not a wonder cure. And the Healthcare Complaints Commission desperately tried so hard to get me to say that. <laughs> but I will never say that because it is not. The wonder cure is the body when it's given the right conditions. And the sunshine, sunshine is very good for any cancers. You've got to go to bed early. We're going to be looking at sleep in detail. Your body heals at twice the rate while you're sleeping. But ideally those early hours of the night. Trust in God. Give to him all of your problems. There's a beautiful verse found in Psalm 55:22. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. He is the sustainer. Abstain from anything that could contribute to the damage in the body. Moderation in all of the good things. And daily exercise is a powerful way to ensure that your body's getting well oxygenated. And we have seen, I could keep you here for one more hour with more stories, but I also know that you desperately want to get to bed so that your mind is clear for tomorrow. <coughs> So I thank you for your attention and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I'd like to close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for what you've taught us tonight. We also want to thank you for this body that we have. We thank you for the truth is that it was created by the hand of God. It has an inbuilt ability to heal itself and it will if it's given the right conditions. Thank you for the simplicity of the message and yet the power of the message. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.